Hi, my name is Tara Bravo. I am helping Helix Water District with the facilitation of tonight's community meeting. So I'll be doing the things like muting, unmuting, um, helping people with how Zoom works. So if you have any questions, um, and we're going to go through how to do this, you can enter them into the chat. We're going to try and keep questions, speaking questions at a minimum during the presentation. But you're welcome to ask all your questions in chat during that time so you don't lose them. And then at the end, we'll go ahead and open it up to um, a Q&A session where you'll be able to answer, ask all your questions. Um, just to kind of give us a little bit of background on the Zoom kind of world, this is what I'm sure your screen looks like for the most part. If it doesn't, you'll probably need to click My name or your name too? Your name too, right? <laughs> All right. I, it's fine. Muted. Uh, just to start and stop your video and how to mute, which some people sometimes need to figure out, um, you'll be just going into this bottom uh, left-hand corner uh, where you see the, the microphone and the start video. Then if you want to raise your hand to ask a question, you can go to reactions and then you'll see the little raise hand icon and you'll be able to click that. Then if you want to enter in a question, like I said, during the presentation, you don't want to lose that, go ahead and click the chat button, which is um, middle center, and then enter in your information just on the right there. So before I hand it off to Carlos, who's going to introduce himself, and then we're going to do a little introductions. Well, um, I just want to remind people that please feel free to ask any questions you want. All, all questions will be answered by the end of this um, community meeting. But if we could keep, please keep the voice piece to a minimum because we are recording for other people to watch the presentation. And I want to make sure they have an understanding of what Jennifer's doing. We would really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Carlos. Thank you, Tara. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Carlos Lugo, and I have the honor of serving as general manager here at the Helix Water District. And I would just like to thank you for taking the time this evening uh, for joining us uh, for this community meeting. Um, we are here tonight to uh, provide you with information about Helix and our proposed uh, rate adjustment. It was important to us to hold this meeting before the rate hearing was scheduled uh, towards the end of April so that we could make ourselves available to answer your questions, listen to your comments and concerns um, in a more informal setting instead of a hearing uh, setting, if you will. As, as we go along this evening, um, please uh, type your questions as Ms. Bravo indicated and, and demonstrated, um, and we'll answer those questions at the end. But if you don't feel comfortable utilizing the chat option, uh, we save your questions to the end and we'll get to all the questions as Ms. Bravo uh, indicated. And uh, we, we certainly wanna hear again, your questions. Uh, we have staff here uh, to answer those questions and we wanna hear your concerns as well um, and your comments. You know, as, as a water agency, we are constantly striving and adjusting uh, to new regulatory uh, issues and, and demands on, on what water regulations and, and the stresses on our costs and operations. Um, but we pride ourselves on delivering a safe, reliable uh, source of water uh, at an efficient and affordable, always trying to, to match or try to be efficient and provide an affordable water. Uh, product to you. We take this very seriously uh, and we hope that this evening after this evening uh, you get a sense of our commitment to to our customers and our ratepayers. Uh, we strive to meet this goal always um, and uh, this has been highlighted over the past year especially uh, during this pandemic of course you know we're um, we've all uh, been challenged uh, by this environment and we're, we're fully aware of many of the challenges that um, our ratepayers, our customers are facing and, are, and have faced. And what we, we've tried to do some things and implement some things um, to minimize, that, minimize any additional burden uh, to our customers. And we'll speak to that um, and our, our, our Director of uh, Administrative Services will speak to that during her 
uh, presentation. But before we we go there and, and continue with the, with the committee meeting, I do want to introduce staff. And if, if staff would just raise their hand and acknowledge who they are, um, these are the folks that will be addressing your questions or concerns or providing information uh, that you may request um, during the course of this evening and during the Q&A after the presentation. So uh, first of all, let me just introduce uh, uh, Jennifer Bryan. She is our Director of Administrative Services. Jennifer. And Jennifer will give uh, the presentation. Jennifer has been the lead really on uh, the rate setting, the, the rate study, cost of service study uh, for the district, uh, working with our consultants and our legal team um, and our internal staff uh, to come up with the recommended uh, rates that we're proposing. Um, Jim Tomasulu, Jim. Uh, Jim's our director of engineering, oversees uh, all our capital improvement projects, all of our engineering efforts out in the field, um, and he'll be able to address anything around capital improvements and infrastructure uh, this evening. Kevin Miller, Director of Operations. Kevin is um, works out of our El Cajon facility and under the, at that facility, we house our uh, operations folks, our construction crews, our maintenance crews, our warehousing crews, our fleet that go out and repair the system, maintain the system, um, and also work hand in hand with engineering to make sure that our capital projects uh, run efficiently. Uh, Brian Olney, our Brian, our director of water quality and distribution. Brian has a, a, a task of you know, taking the imported water that we bring from you know hundreds of miles away from Colorado and Sierras uh, to his treatment plant, and he, where at which point he treats it, well stores it number one in our reservoirs, um, and then treats it at the treatment plant, and then gets it out into the distribution system. So he. He, he and his staff have a big role in, in making sure that when you turn that tap on, that water's flowing 24 seven. And then uh, Amy Pope, uh, our finance manager is also being very key uh, in this endeavor and working towards uh, uh, the setting of these rates and looking at our cost of service as well. I wanna also introduce Habib Isaac uh, of, I of IB Consulting. Uh, Habib is our rate consultant uh, and had Perform the cost of service for us uh, that sets the basis for the rate setting. Um, last but not least, uh, I'm going to Lutfi Karuf of BBNK, our legal counsel, and Lutfi is uh, a spe his specialty is in water rates uh, in the water rates area. So with that, uh, we want to get you settled in, and uh, we'll to do that. We'll we'll show you just a quick video. That kind of illustrates where your water rates goes in a very condensed form, if you will. So if we could run that, Michelle, or Tara. At Helix Water District, every dollar collected from customer bills goes directly towards the cost of providing our customers with a clean and reliable source of water. Let's take a look at how those expenses break down. 43% of each bill covers the cost of purchasing imported water. That's just about half of every dollar that we spend. 13% covers the operating and maintenance costs that keep our water delivery and treatment systems up and running. 12% funds capital projects such as pipeline replacements, tank retrofits, and expenses to buy equipment. 9% covers water treatment and quality control costs, which ensure your water is safe to drink. 9% covers administrative expenses needed to run the district. 3% covers engineering costs. This allows the district to design and make improvements to our water treatment and delivery systems. 3% covers meter reading, billing, and customer service expenses. So when you have a question or need some help, Helix is there for you. 3% pays for information technology, the computers and software behind our water systems, administration, and customer service. IT keeps us running. 3% covers energy costs to treat and pump water and the electricity used to operate district facilities. 2% repays bonds and other debt. And not one penny goes towards profits. 
Helix is a not-for-profit agency. For more details, visit hwd.com. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, that's just a snapshot of how your your rates uh, apply to the district and support the district. Now I just want to uh, introduce uh, Jennifer Bryant uh, for a presentation um, that will uh, that will show you how we set our rates, uh, what the proposed rate adjustments are, and how you can participate in this process, uh, not just tonight, but also at our hearing on the 28th. Um, and then once, uh, uh, Jennifer finishes up her presentation. Uh, we will open it up to questions and and, uh, and also comments and uh, have discussion. So with that, with that, Jennifer, it's all yours. Great, thank you, Carlos, and and welcome to everyone here. It's it's really nice to see some um, some familiar faces and some customers who have you know really taken the lead on interacting with us over the past uh, several years. We. I think we have a really good story to tell. Um, we're really proud of the work that we do. And um, so it's always nice when we can share that. And, and thank you again, and Carlos did mention it for taking the time um, out of your evening so we can we can tell you that story. Um, so we our pre my presentation tonight's about 30 minutes or so. Um, and a couple of things we'll cover. I'll start with a little bit of the history of the district and then we'll talk about, well, why are we here? And, and why do we need a rate increase? And, and how do we make rates? It's a very specific, process, um, why we propose these rate adjustments. Also, I want to go through a little bit of how we've made $10 million in cost cuts and how we've helped customers during the pandemic. Um, we'll review the proposed water rates and the rate tiers and talk a little bit about the adjustments that occurred to both those rates and the tiers this time. And then lastly, we'll finish up on how you can continue to participate in this process. So we keep an eye on social media and we keep in contact with you in the community um, to help us identify, is there something out there that um, may be a common question? And, um, and one of them is about the type of organization that we are. Um, and I think this one sometimes comes as a surprise to, to some folks. Um, so we're a not-for-profit organization. Um, this means that you know, legally we cannot set rates to make a profit. We don't have shareholders, we're not um, sdg and &E. Um, and we can only charge actually what it costs us to provide water service. And I've talked a little bit about, uh, mentioned that I've talked a little bit about the history and, and I love this slide, such a, a great old picture. Um, so we, you know, we uh, have been supplying East County water since 1889. Um, we are you know, literally part of the history of East County. Um, we came close to what um, uh, being established as close to our name, what it is today on an irrigation district in 1912 when we became the La Mesa Lemon Grove Spring Valley Irrigation District. This picture is of a, a wooden trestle that was constructed to bring water via a wooden flume from the Cuyamacas all the way to our service area. We have a, um, a wonderful presentation that we do in each January and the way things are going now, we may be able to do it in person in January of 2022 where we, um, we host, it, host it here in our admin building and we go through all the history of Helix. And, and if you're a history buff at all, particularly of East County, I encourage you to keep an eye on our website or send us an email, we'll put you on a watch list um, and let you know when that presentation's coming up. So overview of our service area. Um, so today we serve um, about 277,000 people in La Mesa, Lemon Grove, El Cajon, Spring Valley Lakeside and unincorporated areas of the county. Um, our service area, which I have the map here on the left, covers um, 50 square miles. We are, you are represented by a locally elected board of five um, board members who serve four year terms. And we have 149 employees. That's about one employee per 1800 customers. And we've been at that level um, for the past six years. So when I talk about rates, I always like to provide some context. Um, we've heard folks say, you know, water comes from rain, it comes from the sky, why isn't it free? Um, and I know this group is, is, you know, is pretty sophisticated that we have on the call today, um, but I wanted to highlight and share the significant infrastructure that is necessary and in place um, to deliver the water to your home safely and reliably 24 seven. Um, so uh, we own, um, two reservoirs, 
a treatment plant that has the capacity of 106 million gallons a day to treat that much water. Um, we own and operate 25 pump stations across that 50 square miles of our district. Um, we store water throughout that service area in 25 different tanks. Um, you may have seen one in your neighborhood or up on the hill, or if you were um, driving down the 125 and you saw that very um, well-known, we call it the combo tank, um, the brown tank with the clouds on top, that's got storage for Helix up on top and storage for Padre Dam Municipal Water District in the cylinder part of it. This is a great collaborative project. There is 737 miles of pipe underground in the 50 square miles of our district to bring water to each of the 56,000 um, meters that we serve. The, the flow of that water is controlled through almost 17,000 valves. And we also operate and maintain almost 6,600 fire hydrants. This is somewhat unique to Helix. Um, many. Uh, areas let their fire departments um, uh, manage and, and, and maintain those fire hydrants, but we do it here ourselves. Um, we paint them, we make sure that they are in good working order because if a fire happens, we want to make sure that we're able to reliably provide that fire service. So the rates, you know, I'm saying in the context of rates, you know, the rates are really needed here. Um, you know, one of the places they go is to build and maintain this large system. All right, Helix, but you know, aren't your current rates enough? Um, you know, I, I pay you my bill reliably every two months. You know, isn't it enough? Um, so we had uh, IB Consulting, who we have the representative on our call here today, um, prepare what is called a comprehensive water cost of service rate study. And this is available on our website under the rates and fees tab. If you look, um, go on, um, on our website, really easy to find a whole page of information. Um, and, and the rate consultant concluded that, hey, if we don't raise rates, you know, we live in this environment here in San Diego County where costs are, you know, continue to go up. Um, you know, we take lots of steps and I'll talk through them uh, in a couple of slides to make sure that um, we're efficient in how we operate. Um, but they concluded that, hey, if we don't raise rate, rates, we won't generate enough revenue to buy, treat, and distribute water two years from now, which is pretty significant. We have that balance we as the management team and, and, the, and our board of directors have that sort of dual responsibility to make sure that we have uh, enough um, funds and finances to support our system to continue to provide you water, but also always keeping in mind doing that at the lowest cost possible. All right, so how do we go about setting those rates? Um, it's a very specific process. It's guided by um, state laws and regulations. And I have, this is probably the, the most text heavy slide I have in the presentation, but I thought it was important, um, particularly if you're new to rate setting. Um, you know, we read some social media and, and it just sounds, you know, some of the understanding out there is that we, it's a, that our rate setting is a relatively arbitrary process or it isn't guided by laws. Um, it absolutely couldn't be further from the truth. Um, you know, Proposition 218, which was passed by the California voters in 1996, um, has these five, kind of, this is a summary, there are five kind of main tenants. Um, we must charge no more than the actual cost of providing water service. That kind of goes back to that concept of being not for profit. Um, the revenue that we collect can only be used um, for that purpose that we collect it for. So our water billing revenue can only be used for providing um, uh, our water service to your property. The amount of the fee may not exceed the proportional cost of service for, the, for that parcel. Now that sounds like a lot of late legal um, or financial language, um, but it really is why the cost of service study is based on usage and demand for a particular customer class. And it's based on actual usage and actual demand for our water district. Um, and I'll go into a little bit how that plays out into the rate structure that we have in a couple of slides. And we can't charge you for something unless you actually um, use it or it's immediately available um, for you to use it. We also have another fee schedule that we call affectionately our miscellaneous fees. Um, and they're for things for special projects or if a developer's coming to do um, um, add extra uh, uh, meters to a new property or you have an ADU and you want to add an extra meter, we can't charge everybody for that meter that you're getting added to your property. So Proposition 218 makes sure that 
that fee is separate from this general water bill. And then the last is really very um, part of this process in that we can't, that we have to mail to you that notice, that Prop 218 notice that you received in the mail. We call it Prop 218 notice, that rate notice. They received mail 45 days before the actual public hearing on April 28th. So that gives you as the customer enough time to um, ask questions and, and make sure that you're, um, you're satisfied with that you have all the information you need um, for this process. So a few slides ago, I showed a picture of and mentioned the comprehensive cost of study report. Um, I did that because this is the report that documents the rate setting process. It includes three key components. First is the financial plan. So this takes a look at the district's um, expenses for the next five to 10 years, generally on a, on a, on a financial planning horizon. The uh, operating expenses, the capital expenses, so what goes into maintaining that big infrastructure I talked about, and the reserve requirements. How much, how much funds does the district need to have on hand to safely and reliably continue to operate the district? So it takes all that and it says, okay, over this planning horizon, um, if I have these expected costs and these expected increases in costs, and sometimes decreases depending on, on um, the particular type of cost, how much revenue do I need to collect over that period of time? So then it says, okay, I, I have this much cost, I have this much revenue, all right, that's kind of my financial plan. And then it goes into the actual rate model, that's the second component. And the rate model says, okay, I've got uh, 56,000 roughly customers, but they have different characteristics. They use water differently. They use, they, we call peaking, they use a lot of water differently. They have an average differently based on kind of the cut, based on their customer classes. So single family residential homes, which is our largest customer class, uses water differently than our multifamily class and our commercial and government class and our irrigation class. So different, so it costs the district different amounts of money to serve each of those classes. So that cost of service study puts those costs into different bucket, buckets and then assigns those costs um, to rates based on usage. So it's a very, um, you know, one of the things that reasons why we chose the consultant that we chose is because we wanted someone who could really meet the technical and legal requirements of providing a cost of service study, but then create a report that's readable. So it's you know, 50 pages or so. And uh, it, I find it very interesting. I, I, I think it's detailed, and but it really tells a story. So if you have any questions on how we've actually set our rates, and um, it's, a, it's a very uh, technical and a well-supported explana expl explanation of, of how that goes. All right, so that takes us from the theory uh, and the guidelines regarding rate setting to this actual rate notice. Its base or its base year is our fiscal year 21-22 um, budget. And that starts in just under three months on July 1st. So when you look at this pie chart here, and this is slightly different than the video that we just show, showed. That one was based on data from our, our current fiscal year. So fiscal year 2021. Um, and then the upcoming fiscal year is what this pie chart shows, so 21-22. Um, so how big is, how much does it cost for us to provide water to, uh, over 50 square miles to 277,000 people? Um, about $100 million. Um, this is, this is the, the biggest uh, budget we've had. And, and what's driving this? Well, this is driving us, you know, 45% of it, almost half of our budget, is from water purchases. Um, it is no secret that it has been a dry year. Um, the previous two years, if you recall, we have been, um, or at least the year before that, we have been wetter years. And so we've been able to, since we have Lake Cuyamaca and we have storage in the El Capitan Reservoir, when that water, when that rain falls, we're able to capture it and then put that into our distribution system or capture it, treat it, put it into our distribution system and then that keeps, helps us keep costs down for the district. However, this year it has not rained. So we have not had the benefit of that. And given that this is such um, a big portion of our total overall budget, um, when we don't get rain, that's meaningful to our expense budget. And then the other thing I wanted to, you know, to talk about early, earlier, I mentioned, there's no slice in this pie that's for profit. Um, you know, there's very little in this in this pie that we you know that we truly have 
a lot of control over. You know, we with capital improvement, we mentioned that big infrastructure we support water quality, we have, you know, chemicals that we have to buy to, to treat all that water, you know, all the way through to the you know, billing and customer service, you know, the IT that is the main, you know, the software maintenance for all the you know, computer programs that we buy that supports our operations. And then I guess the last thing I want to mention on here is um, this bond service portion of our pie, um, which is so small, you know, at 2%. And at the end of this um, calendar year, sorry, at the end of this fiscal year, We'll have about $5.1 million outstanding. Um, and that's it for debt on our on our $100 million plus organization, um, at least as far as our budget goes. You know, it's, it's something that we're careful about with debt um, because even though we're in a very low interest rate environment now, you know, debt isn't free. So if we do not have to um, take out debt, if we can continue to fund operations from our current uh, our current revenue schedule, then we do. Um, we, we don't want to pay interest expense. We don't want to pass that cost on to you if we don't have to. All right, so we talked through kind of, you know, history, a little bit of the history of Helix, a little bit of the technical side of rate setting. We kind of looked at, you know, the, our infrastructure. We looked at our budget and the size, you know, what it costs to, to provide that water to all of you. And then so, and I said, well, you know, if we don't raise rates, we're going to run out of money. Well, why is that? You know, where, where are these cost increases coming from? So my next couple of slides kind of go through that a little bit. Um, and, and the first one is, you know, it's uh, rising water costs, you know, over the past couple of years, um, they have continued to rise. Um, and, and, and because we've had a dry year, we have to buy more water. We just, regardless of the cost of it, we just have to buy more water this year to serve you because uh, we won't be able to get it from rain. Um, when it rains, we can, we can, we can uh, avoid that cost and charge less. I think the other thing to note about um, you know, water costs is that, you know, why does it cost so much in here in San Diego County? And, and that's a couple of reasons. One, you know, we are you know, distributing water, purchasing water, you know, all the way from, you know, here we go, California, all the way from Northern California, all the way down here to San Diego, and then from the Colorado River, all the way um, over here to San Diego. So to, to distribute and transport that water from hundreds of miles, you know, it gets more and more expensive, you know, to get all the way down here to San Diego. Um, and so we, um, that winds up driving, you know, uh, certainly a portion, a portion of that cost. And also the other factor here in San Diego County is that we have paid for projects that enhance our reliability. Um, so in that price of water, we buy our water from our water wholesaler, which is the San Diego County Water Authority. That water, that, the Water Authority has spent um, you know, millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars on reliability projects over the past two decades that really have made our water supply more reliable. You know, it's the Carlsbad desalination plant, the San, San Vicente Dam Rays. Um, just two projects that are expensive, but means that when the drought hits, we we can't we won't say, hey, you know, we're going to have to cut back water now. Now, the state did this several years ago and said 20% mandate across the uh, across the board. We are very much hoping, um, and there's legislation out there that would that would um, not have the state take that step um, this time. So we can because we as a region. We'll be able to demonstrate that we have enough water to meet our needs through our planning. But what? But, but why is that important? That costs. It costs money, and and it, it is part of our rate. So, but we're also I mentioned we're also focused on efficiency. Um, when I have this stat here on the left, our Helix operations um, operating costs. Now this is exclusive of capital and excluding water purchases has increased about two point seven percent over the past 10 years. Um, San Diego CPI has increased 2.3% over the past 10 years. So we feel like we're right kind of in that range there. And, and how have we done that? I mentioned we had our steady staffing levels at, for the past 10 years, we've been at or below 150 folks. We really have this, this we focus on having this coordinated maintenance and capital program. We wanna get every last minute out of these assets that we have. Uh, we, we, you know, our director of engineering, you know, can, if you have any questions for him later, you know, he really makes 
uh, planning, uh, you know, so key part of his work to say, okay, we've had these pipelines in the ground since 1954, since 1960, since 1930, since 1980, how much longer are they going to last before we replace them? Can we take them out one more year um, without sacrificing reliability and service to your homes uh, before we have to replace them? Um, we, you know, using technology in-house knowledge to gain efficiency, this is a big one. Um, we have implemented um, systems in the past, also the past couple of decades. Um, one is our, our GIS system or our geographical inf interface system. And that um, is, is a, a sort of a digital map of the entire district and the entire district's infrastructure. Really helpful when the guys are in the field and the guys and gals are in the field and they need to know what's under the ground. Um, it's real time, it's not printing out maps, not bring that with them. Um, and outsourcing when it makes sense. Uh, we, we outsource, we, we don't hire every function that we need, you know, recognizing that labor, you know, winds, winds up, uh, it can be, can be expensive. Uh, and so we said, okay, uh, well, uh, we, it doesn't make sense for us to train and keep flaggers on staff. Um, doesn't make sense for us to have mechanics on staff uh, when we can outsource the fleet maintenance, for example. Um, so we're constantly reevaluating does, which is less expensive for us to train and maintain that staff in-house or just to outsource that. And we only spend when we need to. Um, we're pretty careful about our money, your money here. And rising water treatment costs. I mean, whether, you know, whether it comes from a, a, a variety of chemicals um, or ozone that we, ozone that we use to treat our, our, um, our water, it, it just has, has increased. And, you know, other point I have on here is regulations. Uh, the new regulations that we have um, had to comply with have increased exponentially in the past, and I'm not exaggerating if I say even just the past five years, let alone decade. Um, and these, ne these new regulations, they just simply mean more work for the same amount of staff, uh, more documentation, more reporting. Um, yet we've kept, I, I saw how you, you, we kept those same staffing levels. Um, so we're simply doing more um, with the same staff and technology, as I mentioned, helps us to manage that. So it, 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 construction costs, uh, you know, certainly a portion of our pie in it. And it's just simply getting more expensive to construct and maintain our infrastructure. Uh, in fact, if you look at um, on this, on this uh, chart, this shows what it cost us in 2013 to replace one linear foot of cast iron pipe in our system. So you leap forward a mere seven, eight years to 2020, and that's doubled. So our cast iron replacement program in our capital budget, what would have cost us a million dollars in 2013 to replace say 5,600 linear feet of pipe is now costing us $2 million to replace that same 5,600 linear feet of pipe. It's just become more expensive. So we recognize that costs are going up, but we also recognize that we have been in a pandemic and some of our customers are really hurting. So we haven't just shrugged our shoulders and passed on these increased costs. We have looked for ways, in addition to all the steps we take in efficiency every day, um, look for ways to keep the necessary increases as low as possible. Um, and we did this to the tune of $10 million of cuts. Um, we took $2 million out of our capital improvement program, but not to the, not to the detriment of the safety of our system. Uh, we took a look at it and we said, we can, we can manage uh, another year with $2 million less in that program. Um, we were gonna make some additional payments to our, our pension program. We said, nope, um, we're not gonna make those prepayments. We took $3 million out of our, our planned payments out of our rate model. And then, um, you know, really specifically this year, we have something called a rate stabilization reserve fund. And the purpose of this fund is established for the times when an unexpected um, significant event has occurred to the district. And we need those funds to keep rates low, to smooth rates, to mitigate these unexpected circumstances. And we couldn't have imagined a more textbook definition of an unexpected circumstance than this pandemic. Um, so we had a $5.1 million in this um, rate stabilization reserve. And we said, let's go ahead and use 5 million out of it. Let's just pretty much clean out the entire fund. 
um, in order to um, support uh, as lowest rate as possible. So on the right side of this slide, um, one of the questions that we've gotten. So we're a special, I mentioned we're a special district and, um, but partially because of that, uh, we haven't received any funding or assistance from the CARES Act or the American Rescue Plan. Um, our surrounding cities, city of El Cajon, city of La Mesa, um, have received um, significant uh, help from, from the federal government in the past year and, and will continue for the next year. Uh, it just hasn't reached special districts. Now that also doesn't mean that we've just said, oh, don't worry about it state. <laughs> um, so we, ha we have been in contact with our representatives and most recently you know, a conference call about a week ago and um, as well as written um, letters and in, have been um, in communication with Aqua, which is our uh, Association of California Water Agencies, which is the sort of trade group um, for our industry to advocate in Sacramento on our behalf and say, hey, um, uh, uh, Cal state of California, get some funds over to our, our water districts. So not only have we made these cost cuts and taken these steps, that's not the only thing we've done. Um, the past year we have you know, really wanted to help our customers. And so we stopped shut off from non-payment before it was mandated by the state. And, 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 and this, this um, moratorium on shutoffs for non-payment is still in place under emergency order from Governor Newsom. We stopped it before he came out with that. We stopped late fees. Um, customers who are struggling to pay their bills, uh, we, we understood that and, and we stopped those. Those are still stopped um, as of today. We froze our water rates in 2020. So the current year fiscal year budget, the um, fiscal year 2021, um, we had obviously, when I say froze, a 0% rate increase um, for this past year. So we were able to use our reserves um, and luckily we had gotten rain um, and, and, and tighten our belts and manage through this year. We've had consistent communication with our customers, whether it was a call and all message at the beginning of the pandemic or information out on our website or just customers picking up the phone and saying, I need some help, what can you do? And we also, you may have heard in the news, we have, uh, um, we've received, we and the other 24 member agencies throughout San Diego County, um, legal settlement funds from the Metropolitan Water District from a, uh, a lawsuit between um, the San Diego County Water Authority and MWD. Um, so we have received those funds and we've actually uh, said, okay, we're gonna put that back in the rate stabilization reserve. And this occurred after this rate setting process so that the next time we set rates, this is available um, again to offset rates. It really did, um, you know, as a financial person, I tend to be more conservative by nature. And um, it did make me nervous to empty out our rate stabilization reserve. I supported it. Um, I recommended it because I think it was the right thing to do right now, but for a hundred million dollar organization to have zero in your rate stabilization reserve um, felt skinny to me. Um, so when we received these funds, we put that back in. And we, we established something called the Helix Helps Customer Assistance Program. And this we've done um, some outreach for. And what this says, let me take one step back. Um, we also get a question, hey, why don't you have a senior rate? Why don't you have a low income rate, Helix? You know, sdg &E has it. Um, we can't. Um, you know, the short answer is we can't. We legally our hands are tied and um, uh, because of Proposition 218 that says we can only charge you, customer, what it costs us to serve you water to your, to your um, parcel. And um, so if we're providing, if we're using some of your rates to lower the rate for other customers, then we're in violation of Prop 218. However, however, if we received funds from a different source and in this, in this case, we received, we did sell some land that we owned. Um, and the, so the board said, okay, um, you can use a half a million dollars of these funds to help our customers um, who have been struggling and hit, hit hard by the pandemic and establish this um, Helix Helps Customer Assistance Program. We launched that earlier this week. Um, we have a third party nonprofit who is administering this for us. We have information, um, it's called Home Start. I have information on our website again about that. So if you are behind in your bill, um, we'll provide up to a $300 one-time credit. You're right. We had, we've had in the, the three days or so it's launched, we had um, our 20 applications already. So we're really um, happy about that program. 
So what did all this result in? Um, this table is an excerpt from the rate notice that you did receive uh, last month. And let's talk about a couple of changes um, that, that are, are, are summarized here. And, and the first I taught I, you know, on this slide, we'll talk about the fixed charge. So that bi-monthly charge. And again, we bill on a bi-monthly basis. Um, some water districts bill on a monthly basis. Again, we, I mentioned we're so focused on costs. It would be more expensive for us to bill on a monthly basis. We would have to have twice the billing cost, uh, you know, twice the wear and tear on our vehicles, um, twice the meter read staff, or if we went with AMI, which are the electronic meters that City of San Diego had some trouble with a couple of years ago, um, that's like a twenty million dollar system to install and and very expensive to maintain. Um, so we said, you know what, we're going to keep it old school and we're going to stay on our bi monthly billing cycle and be as efficient as we can. So this um, uh, increase on here to from $50.48, so about $25 a month to about $26, um, $27 a month, uh, increase of the fixed charge. And, and I wanted to give also some context of this. So how do our rates compare? How does this fixed charge compare to other um, districts in San Diego County? So you look through this chart and I'll just kind of scroll down here, scroll down here. So the average in San Diego County is $69 and 11 cents. And then you keep scrolling on down. So here is, here is the Helix um, current charge. And there are you know, four districts that are less than us. And then the Helix proposed charge. So we just, we move up one, one um, slot, but I can tell you that the city of San Diego is doing a rate study and they will be ahead of us. Uh, and, 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 and I'm anticipating substantially ahead of us. So we will not have changed position. So, you know, the average for all of San Diego County for um, the meter charge, the ratio, let me talk about the ratio. So when we collect revenues, about 24, we set our cost of service study so that 24% of our revenue comes from fixed charges and 76% of the revenue comes from variable charges. Now the average on this list is about 34%. So at 24%, we're well below. And so Helix, why do you set your fixed charge so low? Um, so we set this fixed charge so low because when you look at the rate setting principles, there's a couple of goals or objectives you have to balance. One is revenue stability for the organization. You know, how certain am I that I'm gonna collect the revenue that I anticipate to collect? And then the other is affordability. How much, how are our customers going to be able to, to afford and to pay for their water service? Um, and, and particularly at this time, uh, um, our board said, you know what, we really have to stay um, focused on, on affordability. Um, and so we kept that ratio the same. So this is the second rate study in a row that we've kept that ratio the same. And it allows us to keep that down and, and keep it um, lower comparatively. Um, so the next portion of the of the rate structure that had some questions on it on the rate notice and and again some questions about whether we were um, sort of um, not setting the rates in a technical way um, was the tiers itself um, so tier you know our single family residential class I mentioned that was our largest class has three tiers and and tier one tier two and tier three. Um, so our current tier one has zero to 14 units and proposed is zero to 12. So how do we come up with zero to 14 and how do we come up with zero to 12? Um, and I can have, you know, Habib Isaac can certainly answer, who's our, our consultant from IB Consulting, can certainly answer questions about this as well. So they took, when they were doing our rate model, all 56,508 accounts, their bills for a year, for an entire year, and put that into a, into their rate model. And they said, okay, if I look at the usage characteristics for the single family residential customer class, and I said, and I looked at how much water do they use in the winter, which roughly approximates indoor, indoor water use, because winter water use is generally indoors. And so I looked at all those customers and they said, okay, it's based on the data that we have, based on the actual customer usage, it's 12 units. And, and I think also important to know in here, we used 2019 data. Uh, we felt that 2020 data might be a little bit skewed from the pandemic. Um, so we used 2019 data. And then tiers two and tier three follow on from that. Um, tier two is average summer use. 
So I took that cut that that giant um, data um, table that we had of actual Helix customer use and said, okay, average summer use is um, 26 units. That establishes tier two. And then anything above that is tier three. So it's just it's 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 purely based on our cust what our customers have used. Now in 20 15, when we issued our last, um, uh, our cost of service study was based on 2014 data, customers were using more water, right? This was before or just about at that 20% mandate time. So the, the low water, lower water usage trends and steps hadn't really taken place. So tier one was 14, tier two was 34 and tier three was above that. Um, and, but since 2013, um, our customers, as well as customers across the state, have used 16 percent less, less water. So it made sense to us that this that these tiers um, changed. And so this also falls on to you know the changes that we've had um, between the tiers themselves. There have been some questions about well, tier one went up and tier two and tier three went down. That doesn't seem fair, particularly for the low water user. Um, and Again, it, it's not based on um, how we feel about a particular customer class or a particular tier within that customer class. It's purely based on the usage data. So it's based on demand. Um, so this, um, the more demand that a tier or a customer class places on the system, the more costs get assigned to that class or that tier, and therefore the rate goes up. So in this time, versus the last cost of service study, uh, last time we set rates, usage data, usage trends change. And so that tier one is setting more, is putting more demand on the system versus tier two and tier three. And the same goes for the other customer classes. That kind of demand and usage patterns changed and that's reflected um, in the rates. All right, so a current bill that we send right now Every two months, I mentioned we're bi-monthly for our average customer. It's our single family residential customer who uses 20 units of water. Um, it's $155.12. So I have a similar graph here um, for how we compare with the other districts in the region, the region rather. Um, so of our current, so again, here's all, here's the uh, different districts. Here's the average $175 for every two months. Um, and you see where Helix is. So here's our, our current bi-monthly bill, 155, um, and our proposed, 161. Um, so that moves, it does not change our, our ranking um, in, in this chart. And the other thing I think I wanted to know when I left this on here um, to demonstrate that last year in 2020, when we went with a zero rate increase to help support our customers, um, over half of our, of our fellow agencies um, throughout San Diego County made a different decision and move forward and move forward with the rate increase. But this, this board and this agency said, you know, no, we're going to do all that we can um, to, to hold the line at least for another year. So this results, um, the proposed changes are adopted um, in uh, later on this month. Um, that um, in July 1st, um, the average single family residential customer will see an increase of just over $3 a month or $3.38. And again, you know, we, we, we spend these funds to keep, to keep our water on 24-7. Um, and, and this slide is just a colorful way of showing all the different ways, you know, water is important and used in our life, in our lives. And um, I, there's some favorite, favorite things of mine on this slide. And I'll let you guess which ones those are, but there are some, some favorites on here. So how can you participate? You know, we've had, um, this is actually the ninth public meeting that we've held since January of this, uh, this year. So in the past three plus months on our budget on rate setting, um, we mailed that public hearing notice to our customers. We've been out on social media um, we're holding this community meeting this evening. There's some stories about us in the San Diego Union Tribune and the East County newspapers. And then we have resources on our website. Um, hwd.fyi backslash rates um, is a, a great place to go directly to all the information um, 
if you have any you know follow, follow up to uh, you know specific information or the cost of service study itself is on there um, includes all these um, items down here including the bill estimator and i want to talk about that just for a second um, so if you go here you can say okay helix you know you know this that's fine you know, but i'm not the average customer you know i use less water i use more water so what's my bill change going to be so we've created this um, bill estimator where you can put in your average number of units that you that you use each bi-monthly period you choose your meter size and for the single family residential customer the majority of you i would say well no 100 percent are well mine is like 26 actually are three quarter inch uh, and then you're in the residential domestic class. You make these choices and then up will appear your current bill. I mentioned that $155. And then also will appear um, the new proposed bill. So you can put in any kind of uh, consumption here. It'll show both current and it'll show future. Now, if you don't know what your average bill is and you're not sure about your meter size and um, not a problem, just give our customer service staff a call. They are uh, really uh, skilled at using this and answering these questions. Uh, our main number is 619-466-0585. Um, that's also on our website. Um, I can also, if you put it in the chat, we can send that to you as well. Um, and they're happy to, to run you through this. Um, next uh, meeting that we have in this process is our April 28th uh, public hearing. Uh, and this is when um, the official hearing where uh, we provide likely this presentation one more time and the public you know, has a, the chance to come and, 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 and provide comments to our board and then our board will, will vote on, on this rate increase or this rate adjustment. Um, if it's approved, um, we say May 1st rates effective. Again, we bill two months. We bill for a two month period. So it'll first appear on July 1st um, but rates effective on May 1st. But you can also protest. Um, that is certainly part of Prop 218. And protest, the proposed, just, just so you know um, how to, uh, to protest, it's a very specific way. And this, these, this information you don't have to memorize, it's all in your rate notice that we mailed out. Um, they got to be in writing and received before the end of the public hearing on April 28th. Um, it's, gotta, it's gotta include the rates you're protesting, your name, your address and your signature and mail us to here. And again, this is all on that read notes as well or drop us um, a line or give us a call if you need this information. And that ends my presentation. I'll pass it back over to Carlos. All right, well, thank you, Jennifer. And you'll get a chance to take a shot of water and uh, catch your breath. Thank you for that presentation. Um, <clears throat> giving uh, Tara a little bit of time to, and everybody to submit any questions I want. Um, but I did want to just, just highlight the, the bill estimator. You can check your usage in the winter and you can check your usage in the summer. And as like Jennifer mentioned, you know, you can get that information from our customer service uh, representatives or on your bill. It shows a historical uh, usage uh, of your specific account. So with that, I'll turn it over to back to our facilitator, uh, Ms. Uh, Bravo, uh, to, and we can start uh, addressing questions and comments. Well, we certainly got a lot of questions. So we're gonna go ahead and start at the top. I know some of these have been answered, but we might wanna just make sure that we've answered them to um, the satisfaction of the attendees. So one thing that Ed sort of right off the bat started with was he wants, um, and I know you explained this somewhat, but he would love for you to explain more in detail the reasons for the changes to the rates from zero to 14 to zero to 12, because he feels like it's hurting um, fixed income residents. And he also would like to say that, you know, he's tried hard to decrease his water use and the new rates, he feels like those are a penalty to those who have decreased usage. So really kind of talking and speaking to that and then, um, I would love for somebody to kind of step in and ask, answer. So that, you know, thank you, Tara and, and Ed for that question. I, I, you know, we are certainly sensitive to that um, and, and understand why folks just on first glance would, would you know, could think that um, we were, it, was, it was set based on, you know, 
not on not on a, the, the technical and supported detail. But when we state law of California demands that we set rates based on one of the main factors is based on how you as customers use water. Um, and, and so this cost of service study, having been updated from our 2015 cost of service study, showed that customers are using water in a different way. Different customer classes and the different tiers within that class are using water differently. Um, and as a result, um, those tiers were adjusted. I, I mentioned that we put all our, our um, Habib, our, our, our rate consultant, put all 56,000 bills into our into the rate model for a year, a year's worth of bills. And from that came the winter usage that established tier one. Sorry, yes, the summer usage established tier two. And then that um, anything above that established uh, tier three. Um, so it, it was based on customer usage. Uh, maybe Habib would like to add on to that. Uh, sure. Let me see, am I muted? No, you, we can oh, hear you, Habib. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, and we, one thing that Jennifer mentioned in the presentation is we look at winter time because during winter is typically when customers would turn off their irrigation. And then winter is a good reflection of when we look at water uses that is primarily indoor. More specifically, in 2019 was the year where it was like a super wet winter. Uh, so then it was that much more of a, of a, of a good basis to utilize that year to look at winter use. Um, the other thing for that is, you know, the state at, at the state level, they're also identifying water efficiency standards to reach to all agencies across the state. Um, they started at, uh, you know, wanting to get to 55 gallons per capita per day by 2020. Now that has been pushed back to 23. But then there's also discussion that they want to get to 50 gallons per capita per day um, in towards the end of the of the, of the 2020s um, before 2030. And right now, based on that uses analysis of 2019, you're, bare, you're basically right in that category of 50 to 55 gallons per capita per day. Uh, so you're already reflecting that. And when it comes to um, fixed income customers, uh, usually what we have found is those are the customers that pay more attention to their water use. And most likely those are the ones that are also already within um, inside with uh, under that 12 units. And they're the ones that are, are generating that usage characteristic of bringing that down. Um, so that, that's, that's the discussion I, I wanted to point out. And then similarly with, um, with uh, looking at summertime, customers overall have also been more efficient um, during the summer. And that could be a function of changing, uh, making actually hard improvements to your properties where you have more water efficiency landscape or you have hardscape instead of landscape that then allows you to um, reduce your overall water use. And Ed, if you have any additional feedback on that particular piece, I know you have some other questions, but on this one, do you have any additional feedback? You can go ahead and unmute. Or you can feel free to enter in any information in the chat window as well. I appreciate the uh, information. I still think it's very difficult for fixed income to continually decrease their usage. And I've hardscaped my entire yard. And um, as, a re as a result of trying to address the whole issue of we, we live in a desert, we don't live in abundant water. And um, I, I just don't understand why we had to go from zero to 14 to zero to 12. It just seems like a, a trick, but that's my personal opinion. And thank you for that, um, Ed, for letting us know your feedback. We really appreciate that. Um, one thing that I wanted to highlight is that there are also conservation resources that are available. So maybe somebody could speak to where those, you might find those on the website. Yeah, I'll just comment on that. I've, I've submitted two requests to the conservation, whatever uh, 
board or commission or whatever, and both of them were rejected because they didn't meet the uh, uh, requirements. And so um, I even went that far to try and try and get some help there, but uh, didn't work out. Yeah, we, we may have some, uh, some uh, resources that we could provide you as well and, and some programs that we might, you might qualify for. All you, I would suggest you contact our conservation area at the district at Felix and see if there's anything that we can assist with as well. Thank you. All right, uh, Christopher Glenn asked, if not answered in the presentation, it would be helpful to put the Helix customer charges in context with other water districts with similar customer base. So I think we did that. Um, Christopher, do you have any additional questions on that piece? Feel free to unmute if you've got additional questions on the comparison chart. Okay, I'm not hearing anything, so I'm gonna move on to Ed's other question, um, which I think a couple people have this similar question, which is they wanna really understand um, the need for the pass-through proposal, what that's about and why is that necessary? Okay, I'll take that. Um, so the pass-through is actually something that we've had. Um, this is not the, this is the second rate notice that we've had the pass-through in. Um, and what the pass-through represents is just the, in, it's only the increase in the cost of water from the San Diego County Water Authority. So I, I showed that, um, that pie chart that had um, showed that 45% of our costs come from, um, from the purchase of water. And so we just, we're, we, it is literally a pass-through for us. We buy that water and we pay a certain amount for it. And then the, the increase in that cost of water, we pass on through to our customer. Um, and that uh, is, is, is a very um, common and, uh, and a rate setting process um, throughout water agencies in San Diego County. Um, and it helps us, it, you know, we, we have to pay that amount um, to provide the water so then it gets passed on to the users of that water. And I just want to clarify that's a direct cost. There's no markup, there's no ad that we right. place on it. It's just the, the, the simple, simply the increase that is passed on by the wholesaler to us. How often does that happen? Once a year. So we would see a rate increase once a year based on that? Once a year from the, San Diego, from the Water Authority, and that'll appear on your March bills. Yeah, and I would like to add to that. Uh, the reason that, that that's in the statute, so where there's agencies that buy water from a wholesaler like San Diego County Water Authority, Helix has no governing power over the San Diego, San Diego County Water Authority, but they get, you know, part of their budget, 45% of it is related to buying that water. So they can't go back to the authority and say, wait, we, we're, we're gonna renegotiate our, our rates that we pay you. They, they have to buy that water at, at the rate that the, their board approves. So that statute of the pass-through is recognizing that agencies don't have governing power over third-party agencies. And therefore it's a mechanism that can be utilized as opposed to the Helix being in the business of trying to forecast what an other agency may or may not do. Similarly, they can also do that for uh, electrical costs from, uh, from um, SDG&E, just because they're also third party and don't have the governing power over what their rates might be. Uh, I'd just like to add on that, on in terms of the representation at the Water Authority, uh, as a member agency, one of 24 agencies that uh, are part of the San Diego County Water Authority, we do have representation at their board, but we only have two board members out of 35 board members there. So we do we have a vote? Yes, but not 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 like the control that we have here. So do we do have a voice in in those rates, and we express our you know opinions and uh, with respect to those rates and what we think, what we feel, you know, could be cut or reduced or that kind of thing. Um, but again, we're only two votes of 35 board members. Is there a cap per year on that? Or is it just whatever they decide to increase it by? 
There is a, 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 a cap in the rate notice of 10%, although the average is generally four. Um, and so that's just a, a yes. Uh, well, so does that answer your question on yeah. the initiative to raise the rates? Yeah, would we be as a community alerted to that every time that happens? Yes, absolutely. Yes, you will. Jennifer, do we want to, how, how do we notify the customers when that pass through is coming? We, we, ma we mail them notification. All right, moving to another ad question, I believe. What percent of water is purchased through IID? Brian, you want to take that? Or you want me to? Yeah, I can take that. So um, for those on the call that aren't aware of what IID is, so IID stands for the Imperial Irrigation District. And so we were just talking about our water wholesaler, the San Diego County Water Authority. Um, and Jennifer mentioned in her presentation several times that um, San Diego as a region purchases its water, we call it imported, either comes from Northern California or from the Colorado River. Um, the Imperial Irrigation District uh, gets water directly from the Colorado River. Um, and the Water Authority has entered into agreements with the Imperial Irrigation District to purchase up to 220,000 acre feet per year. Um, and then that water is transferred through the Metropolitan Water District System to the Scandio County Water Authority. Um, so right now, that number um, of the Colorado or the IID water is running somewhere between about 60 and 80% of the water, or I'm sorry, 60 to 70% of the water purchased by the Water Authority. And, and that number ultimately is 280,000 acre feet uh, from, from IID, um, not 220. Yes, yeah, so I didn't bring in the canal line. There's yeah, that, well, there's, there's two elements to that. Thank you for clarifying that, Brian. There's two elements and one is a canal line and the other through uh, IID and the Colorado. Right, and then um, just as a, as a side note, so there's also operational you know, constraints, right? So that, that water is available, but there, you know, at certain times of the year, there could be maintenance and stuff. So they might bring in extra water, you know, when they have a capacity to bring it in. And then at other times it's gonna be less. When you average it out for the year, they're bringing in that total volume um, and then either putting it into storage or, or it's being used as it's coming into the county. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, does that answer your question, Ed? Yes. Great. All right. I'm, I'm um, sorry, this is Cindy Van Mark. I got another question about the pass-through. Um, uh, it just keeps bringing up questions. Um, so it seems like in this, this particular time frame, this is a new initiative that you guys are trying to pass um, with this, this recent board meeting that's coming up. What was the root cause of this thing being passed um, or wanting to be passed? Why, why didn't we do this in the past? Um, or was there, or was it brought up in the past and voted down? I mean, why is it all of a sudden coming? I, I look at it and, and think, well, this should have happened years ago if that's the case, if there's a, something that they keep increasing and why, why now, why is it now that it's happening? What's the cause of that happening? So that's a, a great question. I'm glad you um, asked it. So we did, it was part of our, um, our last rate notice. So it isn't something new to us. I think what is new to us is how we're communicating it. Um, Previously, we had communicated um, the rate increase all together with an estimate of what we estimated in previous years and in the last rate notice, what we thought the pass-through increase would be, what we thought that the cost of water from the San Diego County Water Authority would be. Um, and boy, we um, overestimated. Um, and so we sent out, and, and part of that, you know, in fairness to us, was that estimate was created in the time of a drought where we saw double digit cost increases from the San Diego County Water Authority. Um, and so the last rate notice that we sent out had higher rate ceilings than we needed. Um, and, and we came well below those rate ceilings. Um, and so that we averaged in the past four years, a 2.9% rate increase. Um, but this time around we said, you know, we're, we're, 
although we were authorized to, to do the pass through last time and it wasn't our rate notice, we communicated it differently. This time we said, we're not gonna make that estimate. Um, we don't know what the water authority is going to charge us in the next two years, this rate notice is for two years. Um, so we're just gonna have that language in there that says, you know, we're gonna do the pass through, but we're not gonna, um, we're not gonna make that estimate. We just don't have enough information to make it. Does that answer your question, Cindy? Yes. Great. And it's actually another question from Cindy. You indicated that when droughts are not significant for a year, that the cost for running your program is less, and then it's realized in a rate reduction. I have lived in East County all my life, and I've never experienced a rate adjustment that lowers my bill. Did I hear you right when you said that? Can you please clarify? Uh, yeah, thank you. That's another good question. And I have to be careful um, sometimes. Uh, and it, so it's not a, a rate reduction, it's a lower rate increase. Or like in the past year, because we had rain, um, we were able, and, and because we were in this pandemic, we were able to do a 0% rate increase. Um, and, and so it just it results in a lower rate increase. Clarified? Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Um, Christopher Glenn asked, how can a rate payer evaluate the return on investment for their capital improvements to reduce water consumption? What's the best ROI? Gutters and barrels, drip irrigation, drought tolerant plants, or some other improvement? Right, that's kind of a toughie. Um, I mean, uh, Michelle or Vince, do you have any thoughts on, on how folks would, would evaluate which um, conservation uh, uh, steps they would take that we have seen the best um, experience with? It is going to depend on a parcel by parcel. Really, um, at no two properties are the same. There's always something that they can use. You know, In the early 90s, it was toilets. Uh, in the 2009, it was irrigation controllers. Uh, it could be uh, t you know, turf uh, removal or landscaping changes. It really just depends. Uh, but one of the best things you can do is reach out to us, get a free home water use evaluation and uh, find out what specifically is going to be the best bang for your buck. Yeah, this is this is Brian. I was just going to add to that as well. And I, I think Vince kind of hit on it. But I think as a homeowner, the first thing you do is evaluate where you're using water. So if you have a larger yard and you do have a lot of outside irrigation, I think your tendency for investment might be to the outside. And I think and definitely contact Vince because there are programs where there are rebates for certain in uh, certain investments that you make. There's turf rebate programs, there's landscaping, you know, drought tolerant landscaping rebates, there's irrigation controller or irrigation fixture rebates. Um, and then on the inside, if you don't have a big yard and you're doing inside type work, um, there are rebates for things like high efficiency dryer or washers and things like that, um, shower heads that we actually give away some free shower heads right in the office. So. Um, you just have to kind of look and see what it is you're, where you think you're using water. The home water evaluation uh, put on by the district can help you figure that out. Um, and then look at where that investment is gonna be best utilized. And I wanna re reemphasize, and Vince, you kind of glossed over it. It is a free service that we provide. We actually will make an appointment and go out and evaluate uh, and provide you the, the results of that evaluation and make recommendations. Sounds like something, Ed, you might want to call him and do. I'm just saying. Um, I will. Perfect. I'm so glad we're reaching out and making these kinds of connections. Uh, Christopher had another question about significant changes being underway in the region to reclaim water rather than dumping it in the Pacific Ocean. So how does Helix fit into those efforts? Will those efforts be reflected in the rates you guys are paying? Well, let me let me just touch on it and I'll, and I'll tag team with with Brian only who's who's um, been very involved in, in this project. As you might, you might be familiar with the fact that Santee Lakes is working on a, a purified water program, advanced uh, purified water program. That's where they're taking uh, wastewater from some of the um, cities, city of El Cajon, uh, Santee, and also parts of the county, and treating it to a very high level, and then um, reusing it or, or send, blending it with raw water that's importing it, imported to Helix. And we'll use like Jennings as a mixing basin, if you will. And I know we're simplifying it, but we'll blend it with other sources and mix it in, in Lake Jennings. Um, we'll treat it 
then treat mix that water, treat it, and then it'll be part of our, uh, our portfolio of, of resource. But beyond that, uh, Brian can, can add, um, and, and that amounts to us about 8,000 acre feet a year of drought proof water. And to pottery, that's going to result in about 4,000 acre feet of drought proof water. Uh, Brian, right. that. thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Um, first, and I'll just, I'll just emphasize that that was very oversimplified. It is a very, very safe uh, process <laughs> has been studied and there are very clear regulations and directives on how the process needs to be achieved. Um, and we have been working very hard for the last six years in the development of this project and Helix is a key participant in the project with uh, Padre Dam Municipal Water District, the City of El Cajon and the County of San Diego Sanitation District. Um, overall, uh, Carlos mentioned a, a, a volume amount. That volume amount equals about 30% of East County's supply um, that can be produced from this project, as well as producing that water source, uh, which we can, we tend to term as drought proof. And that's because you're basically kind of doing a reuse of that inside water use, right? Back through it. You're not losing it to irrigation. Um, but it also is an environmental, has an environmental impact. And that is right now that wastewater gets treated and it gets shipped to the city of San Diego's Metro solid or Metro system. And it gets treated at Point Loma and then discharged to the Pacific Ocean. It's a one-time use. So we spend millions of dollars bringing water from the Colorado River and from Northern California. We use it one time and then we treat it and ship it to the, the Pacific Ocean. It's not an efficient use of the water source. Um, and it has environmental implications. Um, and then there's, you know, there's waste through that whole process. So we are excited to be part of this project. Um, again, it's not 100% it's not of our water and that, there's a reason why, right? You wanna do these projects where you have pieces of different reliability and different sources to build that up uh, for the region. Uh, and this project works perfectly in our water portfolio as another source. Um, in terms of cost, we don't expect there to be a significant savings in the participation of this project, but what it does do is help overall the regional um, participation in, in, in water reliability, particularly for East County. And it also looks to meet, even though we're not a, a, a wastewater customer, in, in the next decade, there will be more stringent wastewater regulations. And although we only supply water, you're also a wastewater customer. You're just supplied by a different agency. So our participation will benefit you from both the wastewater side and the water side by, um, by being in that project. If, if you fall within the area of the county and the city of El Cajon, because cities of uh, La Mesa and Lemon Grove don't, uh, don't, we uh, are not supplying sewer uh, discharge to that project. Thank you for clarifying that, Carlos. Hey, hey Tara, if I could just add one thing um, to the discussion, because I, I believe the question um, was around reclaimed water as well. And there's a real distinct difference between reclaimed water and, and what we're talking about is water reuse. And um, a lot of the customers may recognize that out of our, some of our neighboring agencies, like the city of San Diego, do have reclaimed water. OTI has reclaimed water. Um, and the, the, those agencies that have reclaimed water require a completely different um, and separate distribution system. We estimate our infrastructure, the total infrastructure, pipelines, pump stations, tanks, to be valued at over one and a half billion dollars. And so to have a reclaimed system would be very expensive and very cost prohibitive. So the, the approach that, that we're partnering with Padre Dam is absolutely the right approach. It, it doesn't require us to install a completely new delivery system. We can use our delivery system by ensuring we get high quality water um, and, and treating it um, and then distributing it through our own system. Well, that was a lot of information. So Christopher, <laughs> I hope you I hope you're ready for that amount of information su surrounding the reclaimed water efforts. Do you have any other Tara, questions? Tara, you're right. That was a lot of information. It was very great information. I look forward to the day when customers in the city of La Mesa can also participate in a program like that. I, I will share uh, that, that we have talked to the city of La Mesa and looked at potential smaller reclaimed water projects, maybe a small package plants in uh, certain areas along their main, trans, main sewer trunks. Uh, but we just haven't found the right uh, combination of location of sewer trunks and 
uh, uh, would you say a customer, a reclaimed water customer that would work out? So, but we're looking, we're always open to new ideas and, and opportunities. Thank you. I, I will, I'll add just to that. I don't want to keep it, sorry, Tara, but just for the customer's knowledge. Um, the only reason we're not using the city of La Mesa's in this project is, is what Carlos mentioned. It's just logistically the, where the sewer flows from La Mesa, it, it was impossible to get it over to where this project is happening. But this, the La Mesa's water will be going to the city of San Diego. They are also doing a similar project. So by virtue of just being that way, La Mesa will be supporting uh, the city of San Diego's project. Well, that's good news. So I don't see any more questions in the chat at this time. Does anyone have any questions whatsoever? You're able to unmute yourself. So please, we encourage you to ask any final questions. Uh, and uh, Tara, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I would just wanted to add, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be a question. You can, it can be a comment. Um, if you have some thoughts or feedback for us, we are open to that. Um, so I would uh, offer that up as well. Any? I think there's a Steve and Bernice. All right, Steve. Yes. Hi, hi, I have a question. Um, is the population increasing for Mount, Mount Helix, I mean, Helix Water District, or is it decreasing? And my second question has to do with that also, is the amount of buildings that are uninhabited at this time, you know, pop, these buildings are grow, popping up like popcorn. Um, is that counted in your, your system, your matrix or whatever? Well, let me, let me address the, 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 the issue of uh, uh, buildings and, and growth in, within the district. Um, the district within Helix Water District, we're about 95% built out. There's not, a, there's not a lot of large subdivision um, projects here within our, our service area. You'll see some seven lot, 10 lot, smaller lot division, subdivisions that do pop up. Some of our, our redevelopments um, and what we are seeing, though, is along the, uh, the trolley corridor, you see multi-use developments occurring. If, if you're familiar with La Mesa, uh, Santee, El Cajon, you're seeing more and more uh, of that type of development. But within Helix, it's pretty limited. Uh, in terms of the population, we are seeing, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but we are seeing a small incremental growth from year to year, but not much. Right. I was under the impression that actually a lot of people are leaving the area so i was wondering how that is affecting the rates and the water usage and the amount of buildings that are uninhabited that are that are growing is that counted in your your cost of things in other words even though they're not living there now are they part of your scheme there, the whole cost? Yeah, well, they, they, they are part of our uh, scheme, number one, if they still are on service. Uh, they, can, they can decide to shut off their service, and then they're not charged uh, for the connection. But they, they can be, there, there are buildings that are not actually inhabited right now, but they still are serviced by uh, a fire service, or a meter for their irrigation, those types of things. But and I, have, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Are those buildings, some of them, do they have swimming pools that are being maintained and with water? I, I couldn't answer that. I wouldn't be able to tell you how many buildings or, or homes or residents are abandoned with swimming pools. I, I, I don't have that data. But in terms of, in terms of uh, usage, um, I know, Brian, if you want to talk about the, our overall use, and then Michelle could talk about our individual use, and we can even divide it up to cities if you'd like. But uh, Brian, you want to just talk about our overall resource use of water? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, my, my concern, I guess, is the fact that there's a lot of water not that is being used that shouldn't be used, and therefore it's being charged to the consumer. 
Well, I, you know what, and maybe we, we speak to the issue, Brian or Michelle, on water loss and what we do to, to monitor. Sure. So, so I think the question is revolving around that. Um, if the if the if the building might be vacant, but someone's there and they're using water, are they still paying for it? And I think the question to that is, if a meter is active and it's using water, we are sending a bill. And so, and Jennifer can get into to some of the the background on that. But um, if if someone you know, even if it was the, not the owners that are living there, but they didn't turn it off and someone's using water, someone's going to have to pay for that water. And so we do have agents, you know certain homes that don't pay, they go into collections and we do that. So from a perspective of having a widespread issue of vacancies and water being used and not paid for, and then that's having to be paid for by customers, I think that number is fairly low. Um, what Carlos mentioned in terms of losses, um, although we try to run a system as efficient as possible, you know, we do have you know, leaks or main breaks that we do repair and there is water lost from the system. In fact, some, some water we do have to move from the system just to purely maintain water quality within the system. That water is effectively treated among all the customers. So all of the customers pay for that as just a piece of that monthly bill um, as, a, as a part of maintaining the entire system. I see. And, and Tara, if I may just add one component to that, like Brian mentioned, our infrastructure is very, uh, regulated as far as meter metering goes and we have a very active program to replace and maintain those meters to make sure that they're uh, measuring uh, accurately. One aspect as far as volume from overall water use that I don't think we really hit on is we are also a partner with the Water Authority the treatment plant and we wholesale water um, to the Otay Water District, Lakeside Water District and Padre Dam Municipal Water District. So we're pushing more units of water through the water treatment facility, which in, in essence lowers the unit cost of water for all of the customers. So by partnering with that is actually lowering uh, the rates for all of you. Good question here. Does that answer your question, Bernice? I believe so. It does. Thank you. Great. Do we have any other questions for tonight? Can I, I, this is Ed, so just curious, uh, when Jennifer showed the slide of all the water districts in San Diego County, why are there so many? It's a great question. It's a great question. Um, I'll take a stab at that. And so um, I think Jennifer showed a, um, a slide that kind of showed some history of, of Helix. And I think as you know, most regions, they, they start to become inhabited water becomes the first focus of, of what's needed to, to establish, you know, the livability of that region. And so in San Diego, um, that same process happened and, and typically it was through irrigation or agriculture uh, and they used local water sources, either the local streams or, or rivers that we had or groundwater. Um, and then as the region started to develop, agencies, you know, had to get bigger and bigger. So um, the reason we have about 24 right now is because there were 24 water agencies, typically municipal or smaller agencies that started very early in the, the decade of San Diego forming. Um, and the ones that you have remaining um, are at a point where they've established actual boundaries and they're large enough to self-sustain. Yeah, many, many, and I'll add to Brian, many of the water agencies that have today that are public were originally private that were put into place by developers to support not only their, their development and their businesses, but also agriculture that they were specific, in, they had specific interest in. So it's interesting how that some are smaller, some are much, much larger, uh, and that's related to that. Thank you. Might I make a recommendation? I'm not sure if that cool little chart was in the last uh, notice that we got with regards to our water rate increases. But if it's not, it'd be a good idea to put that in there. It makes you feel a lot better about Helix water and the rate increases when you compare it to the other uh, other water districts. Cindy, I, I will, let me comment on that. Um, I, you know, we last time I posted that chart on our website, I, I got a lot of feedback from the other member agencies. And to their credit, I mean, each agency is different. Uh, we're all kind of made up different. We're different ages, we're different sizes. We have different facilities, we have different resources. For example, 
Uh, some of our neighboring agencies don't have access to local water like we do. We have the ability to take advantage of rain when it rains, and we can help, help you know, make, keep, as Jennifer mentioned, keep our rates down over time. Others don't have that, that ability, so they're constantly raising their rates, so they're going to maintain a higher level rate and, you know, for, uh, until they find another source. Uh, uh, so they, I get a lot of pushback on that because we can't tell, and they're, they're correct, we can't tell the whole story of every agency. Uh, so we try to use that respectfully. Um, and I think it might create more confusion in some cases. And I, I would say quite honestly, I'd get a lot of backlash from the other general managers of 24 agencies. And that's understood. Just saying that it causes a lot of stress on our part when we don't see that. It, it actually makes you feel a lot better. And that's why I'm saying customers appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, the San Diego Tribune did pick it up a while back. <laughs> <laughs> they did. We, 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 we like, we appreciate it too. Thank you for saying that. And I just got a comment from Mark Roback, just kind of going back before Cindy's comment um, that just says there no longer should be kind of in that previous iteration. So just flagging that for us. Oh, they know that, right, Carlos? That's her. <laughs> Said, you know about that, right? I didn't catch the comment. Consolidations. Sorry. Oh, yes. Consolidations. Uh, I don't want to get into that right now. We, we won't. We won't, but, but, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a valid comment. Uh, Mr. Robeck's a, a director of a neighboring agency. I just leave it at that. And, and um, there are, uh, you know, uh, folks in the industry and in, in the communities that feel that we should consolidate uh, some of the, uh, some of the agencies and that way it would be more efficient. Um, and you have that constantly going on that review, that analysis, you have smaller agencies, um, you know, that are looking to join up and, and uh, you know, for, for efficiencies um, and uh, cost savings. Uh, we've, you know, we've had a couple of attempts here in the last few years uh, to that. Uh, however, they've been unsuccessful. Um, but I think you're going to see more of that as, throughout the mm -hmm. state as you see some of these underdeveloper or these water agencies that are struggling. Um, they're going to be I don't want to say they're going to be forced, but they're going to be encouraged to consolidate uh, to be more effective and 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 uh, viable, if you will. Uh, I appreciate Carlos you you making that comment. I support you completely in that effort. Can I ask Jennifer or or the rest of y'all one other question I, I forgot about, and that was the. Uh, in the rate increases, it looked like, if you could pull that slide up or, or, or the ones where it shows, is it going down for commercial? Correct, it is. So why? So, um, and that, again, thank you for that question. Um, it's going down for the same reason that um, uh, tier two and tier three and single family residential classes are going down, at least for this year. Um, and Habib can, can jump in on this as well. Uh, because the demand that they are placing on the system based on their usage that we looked at in this cost of service study is different than the demand they placed on the system in the last cost of service study, placing less demand on the system. Um, so they get a smaller amount of costs assigned to them. Um, and those who are placing more demand on the system get a larger amount of costs assigned to them. Um, there's a, you know, a lot of technical um, jargon and background that goes into that. And, you know, if you have the time to read the cost of service study, um, you can see and follow the flow of the costs um, based on that, on that usage, that average and that peak usage for each class and each tier. Um, but by and large, that's kind of the, the nutshell. I don't know, Habib, if you have anything you want to add to that. Um, just simply that as a percent of the total usage demand, they're, they're just become, they're just a smaller percentage compared to before. And I, I just, I will throw out an offer to everybody uh, uh, at this meeting that if you really are interested in reading that cost of service and, um, and want to take that time, uh, Jennifer sometimes jokingly says, you know, if you find it difficult to sleep, you might want to read it. But I, I would offer up that if you want to read it and read it and, and if you have questions with respect to specific sections or issues on it, 
call it, uh, read it, call us up even after this. We are, I think the contact number's on there um, on the notice and you can reach all of us. Uh, we all answer our phones directly. We don't, we don't have secretaries here at the district. Uh, you'll get a main operator, but we have direct lines. I'll just add to that too, Carlos. I think that also emphasizes, you know, this variability that we saw from the last cost of service to this cost of service, why it's so important that we update that cost of service because things change over time. And in order for us to accurately reflect our customer base, we need to go through this process. Um, and it's reflected right here in this change. The next time we do a cost of service, it may very well change again. And it, it might favor the, the residential customers, right? It, and that's what this whole thing does. It shifts, there's movement all the time. And that's why we go through this process. And I just want to emphasize one point, and, and I, it was kind of subtle, but I want to emphasize this. Uh, you know, when Jennifer and Habib and the, the finance team get together and the, this district get together, when we're, we're, we're planning rate hikes, um, we, we, we try to do it over a span of time to smooth them out so they don't have a spike in them and just impact our customers, right, uh, so dramatically. Not only do we try to keep them down, but we also try to smooth them out over time as best we can. That's a great point. And by the way, I think Jennifer considers it a page curve. So <laughs> I, I, I didn't fall asleep at all, Habib. Exactly. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Habib. I don't take offense whatsoever. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of really great information in there, and we actually really do encourage you to take a look, and it's at that hwd.fyi slash rates. Uh, is there any other final questions? I see none. I hear none. So, so Tara, I, you know, I just want to say, first of all, to, I mean, just to thank everybody for, for attending. I want to thank staff and our consultants and our, and our team, but I also want to uh, thank our customers for taking the time to, to engage us and, and, and uh, share their questions and their thoughts and their comments. And, you know, we, we want more of this. We really do. We want you to reach out to us. We work for you. You pay our salaries. You pay water rates. You, we work for you, and we're here to serve you. So anytime you have questions or concerns or clarifications or you want more information about infrastructure or pipeline going down your street or conservation and what, what we have in terms of resources here or how we, how we, maybe you see a fire hydrant that needs a little bit more attention, call us up, we'll deal with it. And I, I, just, I just wanna make that very clear to you. We serve our customers here in the district and we understand that. It's a good point, Carlos. I'll just add as well, I know we're in the middle of a pandemic and we haven't been able to do it this year, um, but we do do um, kind of Helix chats and we do programs throughout the year. I, you know, when we are able to get back in-person meetings, um, we will be starting those, that, those events again. Um, and we do events where we go through the treatment plan. We talk about how the water is treated and we take you through the whole treatment process. We do one over at the operations center. We show you how the pipes are in the ground and how we maintain those and what equipment's needed. Um, and then Jennifer mentioned the one about our history at the administration office. And we go through and we talk about how does the IT group work? How does the, how does the administrative support team work? And how does customer service work? Um, and, and again, that's there to try to show the customers what we're here for and what resources we have available to you. All right. And with that, I believe we are done for the evening. I hope to see you guys in a couple weeks. <laughs> Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Have a good evening. <laughs>